and you actually enjoy quite a lot. Now, uh, now we start talking about the core issues. And um, so uh, the, the, the title of the next and the first keynote is actually quite uh, challenging, I would say, preparing students for a tech-driven world. I mean, in a way, uh, I think you have sons and daughters, and, uh, and uh, uh, they probably are born with technology. And uh, so are they driven or are they driving? And, and sometimes I feel they're actually driven by technology more than, more than uh, driving. Sorry, there is something going on in my screen which I, you don't see, but it doesn't matter. Um, there is something which I've been thinking about, about schools. And uh, as I said, I mean, we have sons and daughters. They go to school, and I sometimes feel that schools are still very much knowledge driven which is funny if you think of it i mean the internet knowledge is everywhere content is everywhere I mean, knowledge driven means that you go to school and you need to know and repeat something and the typical integration tell me about the seven kids of rome yeah there is that one and that one and and so that is slightly old fashioned so and then we talk about skills and obviously the the, the idea is that well we get into skills and then by the definition of setup or whatever skills is the ability to do things, and especially in the workplace. So I'm able to, you know, to, to drive a car, to build a computer, to you know, understand things. But sometimes we don't remember that we actually are talking mostly and should be talking more about competences, which is a bit more than skills, as we all know. I mean, knowledge is typically based on the what and the when, the when. And then the skills are mostly based on answering questions like the how. How do I do things? But then Gergi was mentioning something which is more on the why we're doing things. And sometimes we are forgetting that what we are doing, in also using digital skills, we should remember why we're doing this. And uh, that's the reason why all this competence, all this critical thinking, all the things that we are doing just not because we should be doing this, but we need to understand why we're doing I suppose is what is going to be interesting in the presentation which uh, is going to be given by Divina Tromex, who is Professor of Media and Information and Communication Psychology. I suppose she is a sociologist. And I suppose she's going to talk about media literacy and understanding what is going on in the world. We are overwhelmed by information, by information, by content, and we don't know what to do with it. And at the end, well, we all know what is going on in this world. So, Divina, you're most welcome to come on stage, and I'm looking forward to listening to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Green and red. Thank you. OK, microphone, do yes. adjust, everything. Perfect. Thank you. Science matters. Um, <laughs> thank you, Santi, for this. Um, the, the little tie break we had, I just had a glimpse of uh, what you were like at school many years ago, and I think uh, all of you are in this um, field because um, school mattered uh, in your days and probably the way it mattered for me, um, who am, is a child of um, immigration and um, illiteracy and was able to benefit from education to empower myself in life and end up at uh, the Sorbonne. Um, and I think all of you probably have a very similar um, pathway. And I think your engagement probably comes from that. You're all deeply engaged and I, I can feel that. And I'm very happy to be here. And I wanted to thank um, Santi and E Twinning. <laughs> Uh, but mostly, of course, um, European uh, Schoolnet and uh, Indira and uh, the European Commission. Hello, Georgie. Nice to see you again. I'm, um, I'm speaking from um, several perspectives. I have changed the topic, by the way. You may have noticed I was not a very good student in my days. I never totally obeyed la consigne. Um, but I'm speaking from different perspectives that I'm bringing together, a little bit like you. Uh, I was in the task force by DGAAC that dealt with promoting uh, uh, digital literacy and fighting disinformation. Um, I'm an EPALE ambassador for media literacy. EPALE, the uh, other platform for adult uh, training. Um, I am a UNESCO chair 
for media and information literacy. We're part of a network, global, and I want to bring the global with us today, even though we are the EU. And um, I'm also the head of a, a small um, NGO that works in forwarding media and information literacy and digital citizenship called uh, Savoir Devenir. And so yes, you're, you're right, Santi, I have a bias, which is uh, media and information literacy, um, because information is a basis for knowledge, but knowledge is not in information. Knowledge is in schools and is in communities. So um, this is um, where I'll be speaking from. I hesitated to bring AI in the discussion, but uh, I was telling myself, if I don't do it, we are obsolete already, because things are changing so fast. So my, my conversation is going to be about how do we bring AI into the, the classroom when nobody has been trained in AI, including us, policymakers, uh, even the tech people, I would dare to say. So um, let's look at um, definitions first a little bit to make sure that we are aligned. And my, the purpose of my talk is, there's going to be nothing new, sorry, uh, but is to try and align ourselves into this sharing vision, sharing a view of what um, we are doing and where we're going. Um, what I would like to say is that, in fact, uh, we have a lot of myths about AI and they come from media. And in fact, um, what we have most is an, a bias, it is a negative bias about AI, all of us, because our imaginaries come from film. And um, there is um, a recent panic about AI, existential threat. It's the first time in the history of risks, and I have worked on media risks a lot, where the actual creators of the beast say the beast is dangerous. Mm, existential risk. Is it or is it an arms race between two hegemons, of which the EU is not? United States, China, the scare, the panic appeared when suddenly the Americans realized that in the top 10 um, labs that worked on AI, nine were Chinese. And suddenly, moratorium. And suddenly, what was the point of the panic? The point of the panic was to get more money. Panics are useful that way. I wish the EU would panic. If you could come out of this a little bit panicked, it would be nice. <laughs> Remember, a panic is a way of getting a public debate about something that wants to be talked about and doesn't get out there. There's a purpose, a social purpose, sociological purpose to panics. They're good if you know how to write them. Okay, you notice that the, media, the panic on AI did not stop AI. Okay, so that's a good lesson for politicians. Please find the right panic. Um, but the reality <laughs> of all this huh, is that basically what we have, American way, because the panic is American driven, not China driven, it matters in terms of alliances. Um, the reality is that what's happened is that we've moved from a very controlled type of AI to a stronger AI that has been democratized suddenly by a sudden decision of one lab, one person, open AI. Make it, make it available to everybody and let them swim or sink. Very recent, less than a year. And we're dealing with digital skills and that's one of the problems why we're finding, as we, the previous speakers were saying, where we're finding ourselves again and again <laughs> with the same issues, is that it moves very fast and we are playing catch up. Of course, uh, that's what education is about. And we are always behind innovation. The purpose is to be behind and straddle what is going to last, not to be necessarily in front. There's other actors for that. But um, if you look at how it works in, a ter in terms of timeline, um, there has been a move since, the, let's say, the, la the late 50s. And we've been on in this for, since the late 50s, since Turing. AI has been becoming more and more intelligent with um, brackets. 
and we are at the LLMS stage, huh, the, the language model, the thing that every user can um, use. Huh? And it has always had an impact on media. Social media, a recent revolution, less than 10 years. And now synthetic media, one year. And synthetic media are arguably a revolution because you don't need any more a reference to reality to create synthetic media. It has an impact on fake news eh, and, and on information at large. Eh? You don't need a real photogra photography to have mid-journey. If you've trained yourself to trace this information and fake images by going to the initial real image on Google, you won't find it anymore, which actually gives you a hint. But this is where we are. We're going to be dealing with um, information and knowledge that doesn't exist in reality. Are you panicking? I'm doing my best. <laughs> Anyways, right, so of course we don't panic. We educators, we look at opportunities and risks. So here's some proposals. I be um, beg your pardon for not putting the footnotes. If I had, you, you would be at about a thousand footnotes. Is AI trying to manipulate me here or what? <laughs> um, but anyways, um, I can't read myself what I've done in here. But the, um, uh, what I've tried to do is look at the opportunities in general and, and the policy areas uh, that are um, attached to them. You see that there is participation, there's inclusion. Um, uh, the mere response, and uh, what would we do, we educators, by media and information literacy, please translate what we educators would do. Uh, and you see that every time we go towards um, uh, more responsible uh, action, uh, taking care of um, uh, appreciation, um, being able to build uh, resilience. And these are uh, opportunities. In education, we could say that AI is also providing opportunities, and some of them were mentioned here. I'm going fast because I only have 20 minutes. Uh, but you'll have a, a PowerPoint for yourself. Um, but if you look at the, what happens with education, yes, individualized learning. Some people say it's a catastrophe because um, then suddenly people are not synchronized. But there is, it, it can be seen as an opportunity, especially for inclusion, for young people who have problems and can uh, play catch up. So these are, uh, in a really a nutshell, uh, the opportunities I, I could find looking at the literature uh, research. If we take risks, oops, I don't believe there's more. I hope you're panicking. Uh, but the, uh, the risks are very much connected to citizenship. And media and information literacy, more than digital skills, I would argue, is about citizenship, knowing how to be responsible citizens and to, to uh, have uh, responsible strategies um, and users. Um, so you see that there is uh, election risk. Next year, more than 120 countries are holding elections. Are you panicking yet? Uh, yeah. Um, well, democratic risks, and here we are. But, you know, there's data theft. There's uh, a lot of um, uh, risks of this kind. I'm, I'm not going through the list. I'll let you uh, work at it. And for education? Ah. What are they learning, our students? What is in their heads? What's happening with sources? What is the source on ChatGPT? Remember that ChatGPT has hallucinations? It hates not giving you an answer, so it will invent a source if it doesn't have one. Good little pet that it is. What is a source when it's not primary and when it's not secondary? <clears throat> we don't know, and we expect the kid to know. How are they going to quote ChatGPT? When we authorize, if we authorize ChatGPT in the classroom, what do we do? 
So these are questions uh, for which we as educators and teachers and professors need answers from our authorities. We can't make the decision on ourselves. We have to be aligned. We have to have a common policy about that. We have to have guardrails for that. At the moment, this is much, very much missing in the different um, uh, policy environments I, I have looked at. It's normal. Again, there's no blame casting. This is not about blame. This is about understanding so that you can make decisions, priorities, strategies, and but bringing attention to, to, uh, to these things. We are in a very strange moment, just like the Middle Ages, the end of the Middle Ages. We know <clears throat> as much or less than our students. It's a sobering thought. So now I'm zeroing in on uh, not AI, but on defining AI literacy. What it be like, what it could be like to teach this, to uh, make it available uh, to young people and to their teachers, to ourselves. This is not just about young people, this is about adults. It's very important, and I would like to put this in the discussion. I know you are EU school net, but please think that they are parents. <laughs> Uh, grandparents, there should be a way where schools break the barrier, the fourth wall, and, and spill out. And because at the moment, we all need to be brought up to, to uh, these competences. And whichever way it happens, it's the best. So I've looked at uh, two or three of my favorite definitions. Uh, you see that um, there is this definition of algo literacy that uh, comes from the information sciences library sciences, very valuable information sciences. Librarians are a very important community everywhere in Europe. We are very lucky to have a lot of libraries and information sciences because they are the ones who make sure that the sources are properly documented. The internet is only made of documents. Any kind of format, but it's all documents. If we can't trust the document, can we trust the information and therefore can we build knowledge on it? Mm. Please bring in the librarians. Um, but also you see that uh, there is a, a more um, um, artificial literacy, uh, artificial intelligence literacy uh, definition uh, that is about uh, collaborating effectively, being able to critically assess, blah, blah, blah. This is all the vocabulary of media and information literacy from the beginning. We are with critical thinking. And I add, like other colleagues, the idea of imaginaries, because we are dealing with a lot of representations and imaginaries, and it's fine, it's very creative, but it has its own biases. And as I said at the beginning, at the moment, it's an anti-AI cognitive bias. And to the crux of the matter, research results. Nothing new. Teachers will not do it if they are not trained. Can't blame them. Remember, the kids know more than them. It's complicated. Teachers need to be trained. And they need um, resources, they need curricula. They need to know what? That we are sharing a global vision, that the, what they're doing uh, follows the values of the EU, of it, their country, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and at the moment, their perception is rather of a suffering. Maybe I'm speaking from a French perspective, but suffering in the sense that they have a feeling that the arena of um, policy is detached from the arena of um, feasibility, uh, the arena of what they are actually implementing. And it's this gap I'd like to uh, attract your attention to even more, uh, because um, um, teachers have authorities above them. If these authorities do not encourage them and empower them, they're not going to empower young people. And even though at the high level, I think uh, the EU decision makers and policy makers have converted 
to this idea that the digital is here to say that it's the basis where all the new technologies of the world and of our security, even as nations, is going to be built. Um, there is a huge intermediary body that needs to be reached out among the decision makers, the middle managers. Uh, and these ones are, for me, I think, the next target in terms of policy making. So let's talk about teachers and policy makers. I put everybody together because, again, as Georgie was saying, uh, we must not work separately here. It really is essential that we go back and forth. Uh, when I said I, I part of, I'm a part of a DG, DGAAC task force, I also teach, etc. I do that all my life, and you do too. And you, you have to know the different spheres and talk to the different spheres in order to create trust and, and bring change. So um, at this point, there's a, this idea that we have to have uh, a shared vision, uh, this, uh, this famous uh, alignment uh, that uh, we should um, uh, all uh, strive for when uh, it is complicated because um, AI, lit lit um, AI systems are changing very, very often. And the alignment we have at the moment, the only one we have, is risk-oriented. It's the AI Act. The AI, the AI Act doesn't mention education. It's all about risk. And I've, as you've seen, I've tried to give you opportunities and risks. And it's very important to, to be able to do both. Not mentioning education is a problem because how do you implement it? How do you give users the ability to use their rights, the AI rights, the DSA Act rights, etc., etc., if they are not uh, uh, trained to recognize them? And that's really one of the biggest uh, challenges that we have at the moment. So, um, um, how to go about it? That's my solution. I'm here not to sell a product, but to sell an idea, uh, if I may say so. My solution is to say, play on what teachers already know and what we already have in place that you all have already put in place. Play on familiarity, because if you ask teachers to jump to AI literacy, without being trained, if you ask them to jump up five uh, uh, stories, they'll fall. So you have to ask them to jump one story up. Okay? So what are they familiar with? They're familiar with digital skills in which in Europe, in DigiComp in particular, we have put media and information literacy. Yeah? I'm putting media and information literacy forward because it has the word information. The digital is everywhere, so the digital doesn't exist. When we had the Renaissance, we didn't call it the Enlightenment, or we didn't call it the paper world. And yet that was the technology at the time. It's the technology that changed everything was paper. Novels, manuals, handbooks, whatever. We didn't call it the paper revolution. We didn't call it by the tool. We didn't call it by the technology. We called it for what it en enabled us to do, enlightenment. That's why media and information literacy for me is more interesting, tells us more about what we can do and why we do it than digital. So my proposal to you is that the digital, in fact, is three things. It's about media, remember, synthetic media, remember the timeline. Media are key because that's how you democratize, that's how you distribute, okay? It's about documents, remember the librarians, who has the integrity of information, hmm? who uh, does the coding of these uh, things, who allow allows you to realize that the document has been transformed and has lost its integrity. And then there's data, and data is the new one, but data matters only if you attach them to documents and media. We've had data for a very long time. It's not since algorithms that we started making sense of data. And AI is just a more complex version using algorithms and data. So at the basis, data remains, which is why uh, after discussing with lots of people, especially in the computing world, they kept telling me the core is data. 
You need good data, you need quality data. From there, you'll be able to build not just JAI, not just uh, um, generative AI, but general AI. And you know that this is the next horizon. So um, my, my proposal is, OK, we already have been doing data literacy for more than 10 years. Let's add one more peel to that onion. Let's not start with the whole onion. Let's go from the core that is already there and add layers, because that teachers can understand and can take um, appropriate, if you want. So there's two levels of interventions for us, policymakers, educators, etc. There's the individual level. We have to continue empowering uh, individuals, and the title of this uh, whole event uh, is about that. Um, but we have also a collective level. These individuals have also got to be trained in their rights, in their capacity to use and change AI. The digital world has always told us it is user-centric. You receive regularly emails saying, oh, you've, you've helped us improve Google. Uh, help us uh, improve this app. ChatGPT will tell you, the more you use us, the more you improve us. OK? So the user is there somewhere. But as a result, we also have, at some point, to be able to push back, send back things, and especially um, rights. So now, competences. This is a proposal extracted from the four tables I showed you. Uh, the opportunities, the risks, what should be there if we build a competence uh, framework. There are already competence frameworks about AI circulating. Google has put one out. Digicomp is going to put one out soon, etc. Fine. As many as you want, as long as they align their vision about what we want, uh, and which is why I tend to adopt the Council of Europe's approach to competences, in which skills are one of four. And contrary to Digicomp, Council of Europe adds values. Because at the end of the day, we humans, we work with words and with values. And um, they were mentioned before, the EU has been defending values. It's probably at the moment the only entity in the world uh, that is value-driven and not just market-driven. Are we right or are we wrong? It's only history will tell. Um, but I think for young people, it's very important to, to know uh, that they are building a, a free world, a world of free of expression, a world of exchange of information, of research of quality information, and a world of well-being. China has not democratized AI. Just to remind you where we are in the alliances and the values. Huh? So um, here you have them. There's knowledge, there's skills, the tools, huh? but there's also attitudes. Huh? And what's nice about media and information literacy is that it is attitude-driven. It's about changing behavior. Too much of the knowledge we are now doing in classrooms is about ensuring children have just the knowledge. That's so passé, they'll tell you. That's so, OK, 19th century. <clears throat> OK, 18th century. You wonder why they're bored? Anyways, but the... Uh, Attitudes, and they'll, they'll understand that, huh? because they are action-driven, they're image-driven. Image and action are the same area in the brain. Knowledge is there. Okay, um, just for the cognitive, huh? and the values, huh? because we are waging enough wars around the world right now to realize that it's also a lot about that. And the curriculum. Hey, how do we go about designing a curriculum when we are policy makers or educators? Uh, what needs to be added? AI forces media and information literacy to revise itself. It's fine. We're doing this all the time. I would say that at the moment, the most optimistic element I can bring is explainability. And I'm glad there's uh, computer people here and tech people here. Because explainability 
for the moment is basically saying, you can say, you can tell what is in the black box. You know how AI people are telling you, oh, it's impossible to know. It's a black box. I, I, it's, I've lost control. It's learned by itself, etc. Once you are AI literate, literate, you cannot accept this marketing and this economic argument. Because explainable AI exists, and there are now more and more countries that are making it into law, into law, that AI systems have to say how they chose their data, input, and how they ended up the output. And if they tell you it's a secret, don't use that AI system. That's what AI literacy tells you. Go to the one that's open. Create competition. That's what the market is about. Huh? So it's not about telling you everything that is in the machine, huh? but the input, output. Are the data that are in the input good quality data, or are they biased? Are they old? Are they, are they recent? Are they about your field? Or are they so general that your field in there is totally lost? You have a right to know. And more and more, especially in the, in the information field and the, the media field, and now there, there's alliances that are trying to create language models that are based only on reference media. Uh, yes. I'm speaking with museum people who are worried about dis being displaced in their jobs because AI is curating their events. But I've told them, create your own AI with your own body of data and then prepare an exhibit. Okay? I would say the same thing to the school systems. Anyway, so explainable AI empowers people because you can ask to know what's in there. And you can sue. At some point, suing is good. The American systems are based on that. <laughs> Yes, after all, AI comes from there. So, you know, you can uh, uh, say we want transparency, we want accountability, yeah? um, and uh, please uh, show us. And if not, we'll drop you or we'll sue you. So, before you leave for a coffee break, huh? some, uh, some takeaways. And um, I've put five or six uh, here about the role of education, about the, the role of uh, AI. about what policymakers can do and, and their duty, because one of the challenges for you, of course, is to be future-proof, is to make sure that you have such a, a capacity uh, for creating the curriculum and the design uh, that you can anticipate uh, a continuously evolving uh, AI uh, is your challenge. And if I were to make policy recommendations, uh, I would definitely um, put uh, explainable AI at the priority level, among the top uh, six that I've given you here. And, 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 I would make the ed tech, the technology that is devo devoting itself uh, to providing resources and uh, materials to education, um, I would make the ed tech adopt um, explainable uh, AI for uh, education, because teachers have to have trust in uh, the types of systems that, uh, that they're using. So um, it's all about building trust in the end. Trust with our industry, trust with our policy makers, trust of the uh, young people into the adults that we are, because we may not know as much as they know about ChatGPT, but they're young people. They still need to trust. Humans at the center of their evolution is the fact that the younger ones believe the older ones. There's this implicit trust in young people and that makes them agree to sit for hours at a desk listening to somebody talking to them. And that's how we are wired as humans, not as artificial intelligence, as humans. So trust is, uh, is key. I'm leaving you with some references. Some of the 
things I've presented to you uh, are part of a policy brief on AI and media and information literacy that I've, I've done for UNESCO and that will be launched on January um, next time uh, with um, some policy recommendations that I hope UNESCO and Europe will share because we often work together and uh, we feed uh, each other and I think that's also part of a general discussion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Don't, 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 don't move, because there will be questions. I mean, now that we panicked, we need to pose questions, because we need to be reassured. So uh, whilst my colleagues are there, if you want to uh, raise your hand, so maybe you can just break the eyes again on questions. I mean, it, in a way, uh, we used to say, you know, the television said it, so it must be true. And then the newspaper said it, so it must be true. That was the modern world. Now in the postmodern world, we can't say this any longer. Isn't that true that maybe AI is just a boost of what is going on in postmodern society, where information is just everywhere, and basically, you know, you, you, you can't trust anyone. So media literacy, that's the reason why we have media literacy. Uh, because we need to start trusting ourselves, but then we need to be equipped to do this. So isn't it just this thing about AI just a bit too much? It was there the problem, honestly. If you ask me, I trust much less humans than artificial intelligence, because at the end of the day, misinformation, disinformation was there before, and we all know what impact it had on society. So they just put in a technological layer to make it you know, even worse. But at the end of the day, the seed is still us. So. Is it just a bit too much, this fuss about AI is being, and being provocative? But. As I always say with um, in technologies, um, they reflect us. They are absolutely not neutral. They reflect us. Our biases, our uh, sense of uh, frailty, the feeling that we are not strong enough, knowledgeable enough, etc. So, um, yes, you're right, there is a little bit of um, buzz. Uh, I think that we are uh, having to pay attention to um, two elements in AI that are changing though we use the same words still. One of them I mentioned before, the word source, which is so crucial to uh, content, quality content, and uh, the trust in the source, mm -hmm. integrity of, of the source. Um, I now am speaking of tertiary sources when I speak about AI sources. And I want IFLA, I want the NGO of uh, libraries, sciences, and to convene, and maybe EU can do that, um, a meeting on what kind of sources we're dealing with when we're dealing with sources produced by uh, hallucinogenic non-human agent. Primary sources, we know. Okay, I'm a primary source, you're a primary source. <laughs> Secondary sources, we know. We quote documents, etc., etc. What is coming out of AI? <coughs> How can we make decisions based on tertiary sources that are either hybrids of primary or secondary or are inventions with no connection at all with reality? No buzz here. Other, bu other thing I'd like to attract your attention to all of you were data. And the way, the way, remember 19th century, the way we used to collect data, the way you are collecting data? I need a representative sample. I need to have um, 100 or 1,000 kids. Yes, I see uh, the team there, uh, <laughs> Janet and <laughs> uh, company, uh, all of you, yes. What does Google or Microsoft tell you about ChatGPT sources? We scrapped the whole world. We collected everything, including, they have the cheek to tell us, including social media. So data at the moment are extremely heterogeneous. They're dirty. They uh, present you with the whole universe out there? 
are we talking about the same thing? Again, don't we need maybe a rewording or at least a, a, in our training an awareness that a data, data today as they are collected uh, on Twitter or whatever, um, they're not the data we think about as scientists and researchers. They're not representative. They, you know, they don't have criteria for selection. The selection is all. I don't know if you trust that, huh? but um, I hope I'm deflating the buzz here. So be careful what you're dealing with. Huh? Um, and don't lend yourself to the magical thinking huh, that the marketing people are trying to sell us. Huh? Please pay attention to data integrity, pay attention to source reliability. These are the two policy elements I would like to take you to take away with, plus explainable AI, three policy elements. Huh? Source reliability, data integrity, explainability. Which is not new, though. It's been there before, even before AI, anyway. Et voilà. Uh, so no panic. No panic. But, but, but awareness. <laughs> awareness. <laughs> no, indeed. I mean, that is uh, questions from the audience. You still have five minutes before the coffee break. I'm sure you have questions, but you're keeping yourself because you're feeling that we have an AI agent here spanning us. And, uh, no questions yet. You're eager for the coffee break. Divina will be around ah, yes. pull, you know, mm -hmm. for questions uh, and uh, primary source, for sure. <laughs> so, OK, well, thank you so much. That was thank really you. inspiring, indeed. <laughs> And uh, we see each other at um, 11.30, so half an hour coffee break. And uh, thank you again. See you half an hour.